We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and it is time to relive the 2023 season of which we have podcast episodes for about half. We are done. Finally, we get to move on with our lives and never think about this season again. Except I feel like we'll think about this season forever because of all of the historic things that happened. It was it was a over. historically significant season and it, was. it is something that will probably be referenced quite a bit. Unfortunately. Give or take. Yeah. <laughs> for for better for, I mean if you're a Red Bull fan like I am, then we, we get to relive this all the damn time. Yay, go team. If you're a Ferrari fan like Emily, you just have to relive the trauma. Hey, call it what you want, but we were the only other team to win a race this season, so. Yes, you there were. There you go. At least we have one highlight for the season. We found That's out that our drivers are also strategists. Like, we we had some high points, you know, just, just uh, give us a break there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you got the champ, like, we 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 saw in Miami how Fernando Alonso can multitask by driving a car very fast, but also watching his teammate on a TV screen while driving very fast. But Charles and Carlos are driving very fast. They're determining strategy. And, you know, if they had a chance, they would probably be running the pit stops too. Oh, my gosh. Please don't even put that image in my head because it's just extremely depressing. Oh, 2024 needs to be so much better than this year. I just, I, yeah. All focus 2024. I'm so excited. We only have what, like 88 days, something like that. I don't know. Something like that. Spitballing. Yeah. Oh, how you doing, Catherine? I feel like it's been a while since I've seen you because we are not triple podcasting anymore. (laughs) We're only doing one episode a week. It, it's it's been it's been re- like obviously we've had weeks in the season where we haven't had races but like the fact that there's no race like the race countdown is three months like I I still don't know what to do with myself even though this is the first week. I was dog sitting over the weekend a overzealous that. German shepherd smacked me in the eye which is why I'm wearing my glasses so you can't see well you can kind of see the scratch um, above under my eyebrow um He's a lovely dog, very clingy, um, and yeah, Cute. it's not like I need my right eye for anything. No, nothing at all. So you're getting some, you know, well-deserved break a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> nice. Sure. Good yeah. for you. And what we about you? How are you? You know, I'm good. Um, back in my home, my family finally left after, you know, two weeks of visiting um love them dearly but it was nice to sleep in my own bed went to Uruguay yesterday actually took the ferry across the river it's like an hour ferry yeah. ride so I went with some of my friends yeah um, I, I saw that and it was like wait a minute <laughs> how far away is Uruguay I know everyone's like wait why you're what what's going on but yeah it's like an hour ferry ride to this little cute town and then you can just take it back. So I did that yesterday with some friends. Um, went to dinner with some friends. You know, getting back into my groove. But I am traveling again this next week because <laughs> I don't stop. Um, but I only have six months left here, so I'm trying to you know soak it all in, get the most out of it. So it's kind of like finally hitting me that I'm going home soon. Um, after being here for you know two and a half years, I'm finally I'm like, going. I can't home. believe it's been that long. Well, no, it's only been like. It's almost been two years, so I'll be here for two and a half in total, or like two years, four months. Um, And that's still like a long time. It's still a really long time. It's I still feel like I've only been here for six months, so it's wild to think that I've lived in South America at all, let alone this long. But right, it's good. Yeah, starting to kind of think about my repatriation plans and look at apartments and looking at my new cities and it'll be exciting. I'm very, very excited. So 
Awesome. Still TBD on where I'm landing officially, but it will be in the U.S. and podcasting will get significantly easier. I won't have to deal with Argentina Wi-Fi, so it'll be good. But yeah. 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 And the time zones between us will be a lot easier as well. I know. It'll be like one hour, two hours max, I not think. Not four. So, no, not four. So, or five. Or we, no, we're always four. Yeah. We're always four. We, you don't change and we don't change. Right. We're always four. Time zones time, are time zone very math. annoying. <laughs> and like, even for like for me, this time of year because we're not on the same time as California it's like doing all that mental math um our volleyball team that I work with they are um competing in the NCAA tournament right now we just found out that their game time in Arizona time because they're playing in California isn't going to start until 9 30 um this week so I'm just like okay who needs to have a complain I know complain I had to stay up until like 2.30 in the morning watching the Pac-12 championship game just to watch the Ducks lose, and it literally crushed me, and then I couldn't sleep because I was so upset. (laughs) Anyways. Totally understandable, um, but also, I am an old lady on the inside who needs to sleep. I know, I am too. Um, I'm not looking forward to the new race times, though. Like, that's the, not mm -hmm. the one good thing about living in Argentina, but. I'm obsessed with the race times here. Not having to wake up at like five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning to watch a race. So great. Yeah. Love it. I, you know, it's just super normal besides the few races that are at night and miserable for me. But, it, you know, I get what, 21 out of 24 races or whatever good timing. Um, right. So going back to the US, that's going to be a little bit harder. Not looking forward to that. But cannot tell you how excited I am to walk into Target whenever I want to. So oh, you got yes. it. It's all about the give and take. Give and take. So um, early wake well, up call on Sundays, Target. I know. I will take Target over yeah. anything all the time. But <laughs> yeah. To get us back on track and go actually into our podcast besides just catching up with us, we finally get to talk about my favorite topic at the top of the podcast, contracts. Yep. So the final contract update of the year, Logan Sargent will be staying with Williams for the 2024 season. I'm very, very excited. I know I'm flip-flopping back and forth on Logan at me, whatever. Um, I'm excited to see him stay. I'm excited to see him on the grid next year. I think it's really good for F1 that they have an American driver, not being biased as an American, but because it's such a big market. And having a driver, having three races now, I just, I think it's good for the sport to grow. Um, so yeah, we will see him back in 2024. Yeah, I, th- I think he, he really had a, like, a, like the, the rookie season that you expected out of the second half of the season. Um, yeah. And I, I know that one of the really underrated parts of that is he and Alex were not driving the same car. Like Alex would always get the upgrades first and James Val's team principal, um, he, he had said that they were committing to getting him in like the same car as Alex by the end of the season. But I, I think that he was only driving the, like, the same specifications as Alex's Williams car in like Brazil, um, Vegas and Abu Dhabi. Yeah. And that yeah. was it. And I, so and I he did what think, he could. Yes, he did what he could. And I think, Truly, James is such a smart guy. James mm-hmm. could out knowledge any of us. He, I think, well, one, I think he knows what he's doing, but two, I think he sees the potential in Logan and the fact that he didn't have the same car and was still able to, you know, do what he did with the car. I think they're looking to invest in the potential. And we've said this before on other podcasts. Rather than just bringing in rookie after rookie after rookie, that which is not helpful, give him one more year. He has a year under his belt. Help develop him. Help him grow. Help him, you know, grow with the team. Um, I think that's a a smart move by Williams to bring him back. Yeah, as much I, as I, I want to see Mick on the grid again because I love Mick. Yeah, I think it's really really good that they're bringing Logan back. Yeah, I agree. And like, you know, comparing the last, you know, Williams driver, Nicholas Latifi, I am confident that Logan is actually going to improve 
as we go into to his second season, whereas Latifi, God love him, what he he just really struggled with the car. And obviously the Williams car last year was not great, but you know, he he really did did not show the improvements that I think that we did see out of Logan and that I think that we will continue to see out of next year because I think Williams is going to be on a they're they're on a much higher trajectory and they're also like they will be competing upper toward you know into the midfield next season oh definitely I think Williams made huge strides like it may not look like it in the standings but they made huge strides this year yeah exactly so I think that it, it, it's a good call. Obviously, the the other front runner for the seat was Felipe Dragovic, who was confirmed to be staying on at Aston Martin as the reserve driver, and they weren't going to take the the F two champion or the F two runner up. So with that, the the only answer was Logan, and it was just a matter of when that they were going to make that announcement, which was this weekend or this past weekend. Yep. So congratulations to Logan. Excited to see Don't what he does us. next year. Don't disappoint us. We put so much behind you now. We have confidence in you. Don't make us flip again. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, some other news coming out this week. Um, Valtteri Botas and his boat ass calendar uh, raised $150,000 for charity. Um, I One, I love that he's taking his weirdness and doing it something good for like for the world and doing a a good thing with it. I also think it's hilarious that he did an entire calendar just with pictures of his ass Um, Mm -hmm. and seeing like the behind the scenes filming of like how they got all these shots was so funny. It's on his Instagram. Um, I think his like uh, partner posted it. It's his his partners, uh, Tiffany Mm -hmm. Cromwell, who is an Australian cyclist. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I, he he took the the virality of that scene of him in the river and the fact that he was you know all over Netflix or on all over Drive to Survive naked um, when he was you know in those off season um, shots and just ran with it and I love it yeah I'm obsessed so good um, but pretty cool that he he did it all for charity I'm huge yeah. huge fan of of Botas um, next thing so it's come out and it just uh timing wise is rumored here and there nothing is confirmed of course but the ferrari ceo said that leclerc and signs will certainly continue with ferrari so i've seen a lot of different dates lots of different speculation but potentially getting them to stay through the 2026 season which of course if you've listened to our podcast in silly season what we've talked about Carlos was technically potentially in the running for Audi in 2025. So this would, you know, shore him up with Ferrari through that year of when it was, you know, rumored that he would leave for Audi. Um, I think this is interesting. I personally, if I'm Leclerc and Sainz and I had the season that I just did, I would be like, I mean, I understand Ferrari and its glory and, you know, whatever um I would question if I would want to stay for two more years or three more seasons I guess because 2024 25 and 26 I would question yeah if I would want to stay I I agree I, th- I think it's it's pretty solid that Charles is is, is gonna stay because where's he gonna go um yeah like I there, there there's really no other reasonable landing spot unless Lewis decides to retire and he goes over to Mercedes um which Lewis has been talking in in the the media re- lately about his thoughts after 2021 and if he should retire or not and if he you know still has it which personally I don't think he does anymore but you know if Toto says that he's the best driver ever and just needs a car, then clearly Toto knows better than anyone else. Um, he's the fastest man to, on the track, Catherine. He's the fastest man on the track. <laughs> at, at all times. Um, but go, I, I think that, that Ferrari really needs to either consider, um, you know, how do I want to say this? I, I think that, you know, Carlos is their really big question mark. I think if there's a driver that is more likely to leave, it would be Carlos. Oh, um, absolutely. Carlos, 
needs to you know he does he's he's got the experience of being a lead driver and um they they have shown the preferential treatment to charles which charles is also a great driver he's just not there yet in my opinion um so i i think that it's a question of you know does Carlos want to be locked down to Ferrari through 2026 and through the regulation change, or would he want to gamble going somewhere else? And what is the best option for him to take that gamble? Would it be Audi in 25 or would it be, you know, the non-American driver with Andretti um, in 25 or 26, whenever they come on potentially? Yeah. Again, none of this is like set in stone. Ferrari CEO just came out and said that they're certainly going to continue who knows what that means? I don't take anything seriously until it's like inked and finalized. Um, yeah. Would I like to see these two continue? Absolutely. I think if Ferrari can get their, you know, shit together and get their strategy figured out where our drivers aren't, you know, calling strategy. Um, I think these two do work well together. And I think they're both very strong drivers and they drive very well. Um, if they have the car that's working, if the strategy is going their way, if they can, you know, not only favor one driver and just hope for a safety car for what, 71 laps or whatever. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I think this one's interesting. I'm again, I will say this for the umpteenth time. I cannot wait for silly season 2024. Holy hell, is it going to be exciting? But yeah. Like two There's thirds that. of the grid is is up on their contracts, so there there has the potential for a ton of movement next, you know, going into next year's silly season. Um, and I th I think that there's there's every opportunity that it is going to be crazy. Oh yeah, I I can't wait, can't wait. I'm excited. Yeah, so excited. This is what keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> so moving from contracts and going into you know, kind of our 2023 recap-ish related. Um, Max Verstappen was named the international dri dri uh, international racing driver, words are hard, of the year by Pirelli. Go figure. Yeah. Like Imagine an hour that. Ago, as, a, as of who, this recording. Who else would have been in contention, honestly? So congrats to Max. Shit. It is shocking. Stunning, shocking. Had no idea. Didn't see that coming. That one came out of left field completely. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. congrats to Max. Ugh, he did have a good season. And we'll go into, you know, every single record he broke here shortly. But he did win another award. So go team. Um, something else to recap the 2023 season, Drive to Survive. So there has been some rumors on a release date, February 23rd. I would like to say this has not actually been confirmed by Netflix and all of the information coming out is just coming from fan accounts, sleuth or be sleuthed. Um, and, and I sleuthed. And Catherine sleuthed. Um, the date makes sense. Historically, it's come out a week before the first race. February 23rd is a week before the first race. Do I buy the date? Yes. Do I buy the poster? No. Is it probably coming out then yes but has not been confirmed so we will see on drive to survive but i'm really excited to see what they do with this season i feel like there were so many things happening so many off track things happening so many things on track that i'd like to see the behind the scenes footage of um so i'm very excited for this season it'll drive to survive always gets me in like a good mood gets me excited for for the next season so excited for it yeah, to come it out whenever it comes out yeah, it, it's it's a really great, and I've said this before, it's a really great primer to the season, but nothing will replace actually, you know, living through week in, week out of the, the traveling circus that is, is the sport. Um, but yeah, everything that we've been seeing over this last week, nothing has come from one of the major publications that Netflix uses to release their their announcements. There, It's A, not from Formula One. It's not from an outlet like Deadline or Variety, which are the ones that tend to, to be the first to have the quoted from Netflix announcement. So I agree with Emily. Um, time, Timing-wise, Feb 23 sounds right. But that poster, if if you really look it up and see the original account, that's a fan account. It's not an account. Also, the the 
Photoshop is just, it, it ain't it. Um, so it, it's, you know, yes, we're excited for Drive to Survive. Yes, we want to know when, but nothing has been confirmed yet. It will be soon because obviously it's December now and it's almost February at this point when it comes to time. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think what we'll hear for another few weeks when that, the date is actually coming out. I was going to say, I'm trying to think back to last year. I found, I feel like we found out the date, like maybe a month, six weeks before it actually came out. It wasn't like this long announcement waiting window. And now you're going to do your sleuthing to figure this out for sure. I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I want to see if I can find the release date announcement. Um, do if I can, uh, uh, yes, here it is. Um, the release date um, from Netflix came out on January 26th. So, yeah, so it was, was a month about a month before yeah. the season. Okay. So we've got some time. We we basically have two months before they're going to tell us when the, the release date is. Is it going to be the 23rd? Probably. But we it's nothing's real yet. Well, and that was also the thing for me because I was like, it feels like too early that we're announcing this because this is like, well, it's December now, but it came out in November. And it was like, I feel like this is way too much of a lead up. Netflix doesn't you know, do that long of a lead up time for do premieres. That. So we'll see. But yeah, we will see. We will see. We will see. And of course, we can't recap and highlight the 2023 season without spending, I'd say, 85% of this episode talking about Max Verstappen. So Catherine, yeah. without further ado... Please walk us through every single record that Max Verstappen broke in 2023. Um, so there's a lot of them. I didn't number them, but it's 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 it is a large number. Um, starting with highest win percentage in a season, um, which is actually one of the more you know legitimate records because a win percentage is something that you can quantify like wins in a season 19 that's a lot but there are seasons in formula one where there were 12 races so what does that mean um but max did win 86.36 percent of the races this season and that is i i think the the previous record was like 77 something percent so it was pretty big um another one of those like yes, it's a record, does it really count, is points in a season, 575. Well, we have more points available now than we did 10 years ago, let alone 40. Um, the consecutive wins record, that was the one that um, previously had been, you know, some contention um, because it was it was nine races, but it was also this other guy who, Alberto Ascari, had nine races, but one of them was technically IndyCar back then in the 50s. So that was like questionable of who actually held that record. Now it's no longer a question. Max has it with 10. And going into next season, he is sitting on a seven race win streak. So if Red Bull does Red Bull things and gives Max another a ridiculous car in the RB20, then we might see that record get broken next year as well. Um, we've got... Because all, all he has to do next year is win four races and, and then it's over. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, then, then then the consecutive win streak becomes 11. So we'll see. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot. But if you're a Red Bull fan. If you're a Red Bull fan. The number of times mm-hmm. I have to hear you say that. I, I can't know. wait for next season. I, You know what, Catherine? I just hope that Mercedes has the best car and Lewis Hamilton wins every single race. <laughs> because we'll both hate it, but you'll hate it more. And then I just have to say, well, if you're a Mercedes <laughs> fan. Mercedes <laughs> fan. Anyways. Sorry. I, I at, at this point in, in this career, I can see um, Fernando Alonso winning every race more than I can see Lewis Hamilton, but that's just, that's just me. Not if and Toto has anything to do with it. Clearly. We, it, it's Toto's world. We're just living in it. Uh, but back to, to the Max records, podiums in a season. He's got that record. As we all know, he's got the record for most laps led in a season with 1,003. Um, he's got the highest percentage of laps led in a season. Um, and this here, here's where we get the, the ones that I, I am entertained by that Emily's not going to like, but we have most wins from pole at 12. Um, but he did not break the record for most wins from a Charles Leclerc pole in a season because he only had four. 
last year. Only he had, like, had four. I know. Poor, poor Charles. Like one of these days, he's got to convert pole to a win and not just convert pole to a Max Verstappen win. I know. It's yeah. Dark times. Dark times. I know. Yeah. All right. Well, we're keep almost going. done. Keep going of. on this soapbox. <laughs> The, the marathon continues. Um, he's got the biggest point gap between P1 and P2 in the driver's standings with 239 points. Uh, most consecutive races as championship leader, 39 races. Um, um, most consecutive point scored um, point scored of active drivers um, since Imola 2022. Most top two finishes. Um, most hat tricks in a season. Um, most pit stops by a winning driver in an F1 race, which I think is just really random. Um, he is the only driver in F1 history to win a race three times in one country, um, which I think is, you know, the United States is big. So, of course, we're getting to the point where we have three races in it. Um, and he also tied for the most races left to go in a season um, after winning the World Drivers Championship with six. Um, and he is the third driver in Formula One history to complete every lap of a season, um, joining Michael Schumacher in 2002 and Lewis Hamilton in 2019. Are we done or is there more? <laughs> I mean, there probably I feel like we are. just have to keep going. There, there uh, probably are, but those were the ones off the list that I found and that I double checked with the record book, um, which only matters to Wikipedia, but you know, is what it is. Um, but it, it's safe to say that this is one of the most dominant seasons in history for a single driver and a single constructor. Um, this doesn't even count the, the records that Red Bull as a racing team broke, which there are a few more of those as well. Yeah, I mean, whichever way you slice it, Max had a phenomenal season. And yeah. unfortunately, I'm now on record saying that. Um, but he did have a good season. The car was unbeatable. Like, let's just be real. It was unbeatable. Um, he drove very well in the car. And next year they have to get a new one and everyone else will have a new car as well. And hopefully everything will go better, but hats yeah. off to Max. He did have a really good season and it was as much as it pained me. It was really, uh, really something to watch. So pretty special season. Yeah, I, I totally get it. Um, I'm still working my way through the 2016 season for reasons to be discussed probably at some point in January. Um, but like, I, I, I can understand why, you know, people could take issue with a single team being so dominant. Do I love seeing Max and Red Bull winning all the time? Yes. Would I love to see more of a competition at the front? Also? Yes. Yeah. As Christian Horner would say, change your fucking car. <laughs> and then maybe they'll have some competition and, but I think it's also just has to do with the regulations like this being, you know, a new year. And I think next year, next year, all the teams will have time to catch up. I think, I don't know. I yeah. think next year it's going to be very competitive. I, I personally I think agree. that. Yeah. I'm, I, I I'm, think that I'm with, really hoping so with we'll the see. trajectories of teams like McLaren and Aston Martin, and even, you know, Williams and Alpha Tauri or whatever the heck they're going to be called next year. Um, I, I think that we're going to, we're going to see a, a bigger battle for the midfield. I think that we're going to see, you know, more teams getting more points and it's not just going to be Red Bull getting every major available points grab for a weekend. Which I'm yeah. excited to see. I, I I like the fight. Like there there has to be a happy medium between Abu Dhabi 2021 and the 2023 season where Red Bull just won everything, bar one race. Yeah, but regardless, it's always going to be entertaining because there's oh, always yeah. going to be shit going on. So we will see. I'm excited. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything else to add about Max Verstappen? I mean, probably, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> that's an open-ended question. That's a that's a dangerous one there. 
Um, well, if we are done discussing Max and his historic season, we can move on to some really good races. So Catherine and I, mostly Catherine, um, but in my agreement, we found five races that if you are going to go back and watch the season, these are ones to watch. And we kind of highlighted reasons why as well. So first one, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that was, you know, it it was one of those races early early in the season where where you're like you're you're seeing Red Bull and you're like wow Red Bull looks really good but you're also seeing things that you're not expecting like Aston Martin proving that the first race of the year wasn't a fluke and you have the the really fun off track things of Fernando getting his hundredth career podium losing his hundredth career podium and then getting his hundredth career podium back. Uh. I think that's when uh, the the George vira- virality, is that a word? The viralness yeah, of George um, just started to click for me. And all of his like oh, yeah. weird Instagram, everything killed it all season uh, with the trophy and the mailing it and everything, whatever. Um, but no, that was a really fun race to watch. And it was exciting to see Fernando on the podium for a hundredth time. Um, I don't know how many times we got reminded of how old he was on that podium, <laughs> but we did. Um, yeah. The the weekly reminder of how, you know, how old for, uh, Fernando Alonso is. Um, but definitely a good race. I, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. I think one of my favorite races this year was Monza. Oh, yeah. The Tifosi are insane. And this was Mm -hmm. such a good battle for Ferrari for second and third, like Max won, obviously. Um, But it was such a good race. And seeing the Ferrari fans come out in masses is insane. Like, it's just, you get chills just watching it and seeing it. And it was, you know, really cool to see. I really liked this race. Yeah, I think I think it was great. And I think what, what made it like a step up even better was just like the timing that they released those radio calls between Charles and Carlos and their engineers and like no risk. And then Charles is like, I'm going to take every risk possible. Um, and just like the fact that they let them fight. But it like it, in 2022, when the drivers were fighting, it was Fernando and um, Esteban at Alpine the and they're like why are you fighting for seventh place can you fight other drivers please um but then in this situation you've got the Ferrari drivers they're battling for p2 and p3 together um and it was like one of those really exciting like massive nail biters because like one wrong move and these drivers are in the wall and like the fact that in retrospect they managed to make it across the finish line safely just made it one of the top battles of the year yeah, at the entire time, I think I was messaging you. I'm like, what are they doing? Something bad's going to happen. They're both going to crash. And then they're both going to DNF. And this is going to be really bad. And I'm like holding my yeah. breath. And I'm just like, ah. <sighs> I had so much anxiety. But again, that's why it was so much fun to watch this race. So Yeah, exactly. Another good one, Zanport. One, I just love saying the word Zanport. Um, but also, this was, I think one of the more wild weather weekends would say yeah if that's fair um lots of rain gasly got podium again how'd that happen um liam lawson yes drove like a champ his debut um so there was a lot going on in a good old zanvoort but i think that one and all of like the rain and everything was a a good one yeah, and, and just as, like, you know, seeing the Tifosi descend upon Monza and then, you know, Imola, when Imola's not being rained out, in Zandvoort, you've got the Orange Army. Um, or if you're Lando Norris, all those Papaya fans. Um, but it, it just, it was, it's such a crazy, you know, fan experience. And it's the type of track and the, the location that just is really conducive to some really exciting racing. And then, yeah, 
tips on how Gasly ends up on the podium. Um, you have, unfortunately, Danny Ricardo, you know, breaking his hand, but you have Liam Lawson as the 84th AlphaTauri driver to drive this season. So, like, there's so many things that happened in that weekend. It, it's just really one that you have to kind of, like, go back and live in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another race that we obviously have to highlight one because it's such a cool race at night but also because it's the only race where red bull did not win singapore oh my god i was so excited carlos won singapore was amazing he this was when carlos decided to play strategist and give lando drs so lando could fight the drivers behind him um i Loved this race. I loved watching Max Verstappen not be on podium. So it was great. Loved this yeah, race. Yeah, it was. This is a highlight was, for me. <laughs> it's it's the OG F1 night race. It's you know one of the more challenging races of the of the track uh, of the of the season. Obviously, the most challenging this year was um, Qatar, which is challenging for other reasons. But but yeah, and the fact that you had this amazing four way battle for first with the, both Mercedes cars um, and Lando and Carlos teaming up together and giving us flashbacks to their days together at McLaren, uh, George putting it in the wall on like the second to last turn, um, and, and which is also what Lando did, but Lando managed to get out of it. Um, it was quite the highlight. Yeah, no, this is a really good race. This and this was this race went down to the wire too. It wasn't like mm-hmm. everyone was just running away with it like some of the earlier races in the season. So this was a really, really good one. Um yeah. and then our last race, which I think just because of the spectacle and the is this race even happening, is Vegas. Um, whole weekend was a shit show, but the race was really, really good. Um yeah. still not over the manhole covers. And I never will be. Oh, yeah. I think I'm still sleep deprived from that night. Yeah, this was a brutal one. I'm sure it's only going to get worse. But looking forward to Vegas 2024. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think one of the biggest, I mean, there were so many big concerns going into it. But I think like the first big concern was is this track going to be any good um because it just looks like an upside down pig or it looks like um there's some pictures of lewis hamilton holding his dog roscoe upside down and the track kind of looks like that too and so the question is like is that conducive to good racing and while there are some issues with like i think that that the the vegas boulevards um um strip is is it too long of a straight but the track brought some really great racing and some amazing overtakes. Yeah, no, it did. It was, there was good racing. Like I give this whole weekend shit because of all the, you know, off track issues on track issues too, but Mm -hmm. it was a really solid race, which is why it made it into our top five. Yeah. I I would happily pull that one up on F1 TV and watch that one again because it was it was very exciting um, and I think that we're going to get some good racing out of Vegas again even though I still personally don't think that you know we're going to be sticking with this same track layout for the next 10 years I I do think that we're going to move off strip at some point I agree I agree I would also like to give some honorable mentions to Austria and Brazil Austria for the sole reason that everyone and their mother got 27,000 track <laughs> limits called and we didn't yeah. actually have results for like six, seven hours after the race because the stewards had to look at all of the issue, all of the, you know, um, I think they said something like there being a, a thousand violations. It was like 1127 or something like that. Yeah. Violations yeah. for track limits, which is absolutely insane. Um, it's also a very short track. It's very fast. And everyone was going off and highly suggest you watch that just only for the, for the radio calls only everyone was calling (laughs) and turning on everyone. It's like they went off, they went off, they went off, they went off this corner, this corner. So funny. Paul Monitor Lewis Hamilton. Oh my gosh. I know. And then I don't know who was behind Checo. I think it was George at one point. He's like, Checo keeps going off on every corner. Um, Highly recommend Austria. And then Brazil. (sighs) 
I will eat my words. This was a good sprint weekend. Mm. Um, it we was the only weekends. one that was good. Yes, we hate all sprint weekends. We do not support the sprint weekend format in its current form. But Brazil was a good sprint weekend. Also, the corner one it was start of the race uh, was absolutely insane. And that's just worth it alone. So if you have, you know, few spare hours or a whole day to just binge watch something, you have F1 TV, highly suggest these five races and Austria and Brazil as well. Good, uh, good races to revisit this year. Yes, absolutely. Well, Catherine, you want to head into our, some of our highlights for the season? Absolutely. I think it's time. Yeah, um, I think it's time. So, so we have, we've done highlights in two different ways this year. Um, we have our, our top three highlights of the season, but we also have our top insert number here moments of the season, which we'll be releasing closer to Drive to Survive dropping in probably late February next year. Um, but TBD. So, so there, there are so many like on track, but not racing moments that we do want to highlight. So those will be coming soon. Um, but until then we have our three highlights. Emily, do you want to start with yours? Yes. So obviously number one, Danny Rick back in a seat. Yep. My heart is so happy. Love to have him on grid. Like it was nice having him around the sport in the beginning of the season being like Red Bull's third driver and just seeing him in all of their marketing and all of their like videos, seeing him on socials, being being there. But having him back just makes me so happy. Um, we had him back, and then he was out, and then he was back again. Um, but I'm that was a very big highlight for me because when he was not, when he did not have a seat going into this season, I was really sad. I really enjoy him. Mm-hmm. He's a shining light in the grid. Let's say. Um, so that was a, a big highlight for me. And um, also the moment of the season that started our podcast. It is. It truly is. Yeah. The ship. What is it? The something that launched a thousand ships. There's a saying <laughs> there. The face that launched a, th- uh, launched a thousand ships. Yeah, sure. So thank you. Thank you, Danny, anyway. for helping us launch our podcast. Um, Oh, I can't believe I put this as my second, but here we go. Um, Max's historic season. So as much as I talk shit and I hate Red Bull and I don't like Max Verstappen, I appreciate the, you know, what it takes. And I appreciate the skill and the ability of him on having such a historic season. Like, you don't just have like, you know, a good season like this out of nowhere. He's a fantastic driver. The engineers got everything right when everyone got it wrong. So, I mean, to witness a historic season like this was unfortunately incredible to watch, let's say. Um, but that was a it's a pretty big highlight to to see a driver in my lifetime be so dominant. Um, yeah. So it, that's pretty cool. And then top three or my third of my top three if anyone listens Hmm. to this podcast if anyone knows me they know that I have loved talking about one thing more than most besides contracts the double DNF (laughs) of Checo this oh my gosh I don't know how you double DNF he like almost double DNF to second race too and I was like how do you come back from a double double DNF how many doubles do we need to put in there um but yeah this was a I don't want to say it's a highlight because I know it was a low point for him but it was a very memorable moment of the season for me and I will never forget Checo's double DNF from the 2023 season so I mean totally understandable obviously double DNFs are things that happen a lot more and like the yield days of formula one but the fact that like this was one of the like probably the first modern double DNF was just bananas oh yeah oh yeah and like I think part of it for me is that everyone including myself shits on Ferrari and like how backwards things go and how like everything's not going right so I think it just gave me a little bit of joy inside to see like not everything's you know greener on the other side of the fence (laughs) so 
I don't know. I'm it's not going to point out me. that this is a, that was a Red Bull strategy so that he wouldn't have to serve his penalty as a grid drop in the next race. I'm not going to point that out. But I will point out my three <sighs> highlights. Okay, well, hit me with your three highlights then. So you said um, one of your highlights was Max's historic season in general. Mine specifically is of the 800 records he broke. I think that the consecutive driver wins record um, was like the best one that that you know that he could have broken. Like that's the if if there, if you're gonna rank the the records he broke this year, I think that that's the number one. Um, and then my number two is um, Perez actually managed to hold on to P2 in the driver's standings. And I think that, I don't know you how. know, I, I don't understand how either because he just had no. such a like bottomless pit of misery in the, like, the entire middle <laughs> portion of the season, <laughs> including the double DNF in Suzuka. <laughs> so how do you have... Um, and obviously, you know, Lewis's disqualification helped significantly. Um, but I think that, you know, toward the end of the season, he had recovered enough that I think he would have been able to hold on even with that one point edge. Um, but the fact that he managed to hold on to P2, I was like, that's, that's a memorable moment, moment for me. And then my third most memorable moment was um, when Lando overtook Max at Silverstone this year. Um, I, I remember I was at camp iPad in hand, watching that on some Sunday morning um, while everyone's like, what is Catherine doing? Um, and it's like, yeah, it didn't last very long, but that was the first sign that like something's happening with McLaren and yeah. the McLaren we saw in Bahrain is not the McLaren that we're going to see at the end of the year. No. And it was just exciting to see Lando overtake Max in general. And I remember like messaging you and being like, oh my God, oh my God, Lando, Lando. And if anyone doesn't believe me, my messages really are OMG, OMG, OMG. <laughs> that is like, yeah. it's like consecutive OMGs when anything big happens. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, those are, those are solid. <laughs> you only get them every single race weekend. Yeah. Um, but those are some solid highlights. I, I think this season, like as boring as people may say it was I think there's a lot that came out of it and it was still a very exciting season to watch absolutely yeah I, I think that just to say that because Max is winning every race and that Red Bull is so dominant makes Formula One worse which we have an episode of is Max Verstappen's dominance d damaging Formula One the answer um, if you don't have the time to watch that episode is no because um, there is always something happening on track and you're not going to have a banger race every weekend, but you're still going to have predominantly something exciting and something interesting to watch throughout your entire season. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well said. Could not have said it better myself. And I think I said that in the same exact po way on that podcast that we did about Max Verstappen, but it just, it's said so eloquently. I try. Oh, well, with that, I think we move into our, our highs and lows of the season for both teams and drivers. So standout driver of the season for you, who would that be? I there, there are a ton of options, but I think that I have to give it to Fernando Alonso because of, of all the things that we did not see coming this year. Fernando Alonso and the performance in that Aston Martin, especially in the first half of the year, was completely out of left field, but one of the best things that we got to have this season. Agreed. Agreed. It was definitely a highlight the very first race, seeing him on podium and us being like, oh, uh, what just happened? What? Is he back? Is he back? What's, what's happening? This is exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great one. Like you said, there's so many to pick from. Um, I, I, I want to say I'm not taking the easy way out on this one. I feel like this is very big of me for choosing this driver. <laughs> but it's hard to give a standout driver of the season award and not give it to Max Verstappen for the 27, you know, soapbox reasons that we had in the top of the podcast. Um, if you think of 2023, the driver you think of is Max Verstappen. So I had to yes. give it to him. It's 
again, not the easy way out because I am me and I don't support Red Bull. So I think it's very big of me that I, you know, am giving him all of these accolades this podcast. I'm very proud of myself. I'm proud of you. I'm this is growth. You. This is growth. So then moving on to teams, who do you think uh, was the standout team this season? I got to give it to McLaren. They had a terrible yeah. start to the year. But oh, like six I said, you know, Silverstone. What are you talking about? That's not how you run yeah, your exactly. race? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's totally fine. But when you have, you know, the perform, like, I, I think it was Silverstone. That, that, that was when we're like, wait is McLaren actually okay? Um, and then to have McLaren come out at the end of the season and to be the team that, you know, posed the biggest threat to Red Bull, that's just, like, you, they they worked, though their engineers, mechanics, everyone back back at the factory, they worked so hard to, to get McLaren to where they ended this season. Like, that just can't be overlooked. No, it can't. I... Completely agree. They had a really good season. Did not start out that way. I remember when we were talking about this before we had a podcast, it was like, uh, what happened to McLaren? What's oh, going yeah. on? It was Lando like, oh, so is going to have a really Daniel long, Ricardo. hard season. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, but no, they did turn it around and they definitely made up points. So they did have a good season. Um, yeah. So... I'm going a little off book on this one. Go figure, Emily. Um, but I gave my standout team of the season to Williams. Okay. I know. But if you look at it, they've had their best season points-wise since like 2017, I want to say. And I feel like they're making up ground, continuing to grow, really investing in the program, I mean, Alex Albon made it into Q3 a ton, and we were pick. I I mean, I picked him for Q3. People were picking him for Q3. When's the last time that we've seen a Williams, you know, driver being talked about like Alex Albon? So I think maybe this leans more on Alex Albon's end of Williams than Logan Sargent, but I think Williams is really coming around. I think, like you said er earlier in the podcast, they're really going to start contending for like that mid tier next year um I I don't know I think that they really stood out to me because normally like you said when it was Latifi it was always like oh they're going to be 19th and 20th they're going to be 19th and 20th did Logan Sargent crash and burn sometimes yes but Alex Albon did finish in the points several times Logan Sargent eventually did by default get points but it was better than before. So for that reason, they get my my standout team of the season. Yeah, and if if we have to pick like a home run team principal hire, it's got to go to James Bowles. Oh, James Bowles. Oh my gosh, of course. I like I would follow that man like into a burning fire and just trust that he would understand the engineering on how to get through safely. Like my James weekends yeah. are my favorite weekends and it's just gold. Yeah, we, we cool. need more of him explaining Formula One. I could listen to him read Physics 101 and be like, yes, I'm understanding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, and then honorable yeah. mention for standout team, and it pains me to say this, um, and I was also rooting for Ferrari, is um, Mercedes for managing to hold on to P2 and the constructors. And just, I've, I've said it before, I will say it again. They just are very sneaky and, you know, underrated with the way that they have those like P4, P5, P6 finishes. And they grab all these points that really feel like they're coming from out of nowhere um, because there are so many other things that are being talked about that you forget that Mercedes is coming out of these big points halls every week and somehow yeah, managed to hold on to p2 yeah they solidly end up in the points somehow like every week and when you're consistently in the points and not you know crashing on the formation lap and not scoring mm. any points um that'll do it that'll keep you in a p2 so and honestly i'm still disappointed with ferrari's strategy of just like hoping carlos gets a safety car i feel like they could have gotten somewhere but what do i know i'm just a fan not a strategist but I feel like their strategists yeah. aren't even strategists at this point but I digress um going into biggest disappointment as a team 
You know, yeah. this one, again, I feel like I'm kind of coming out of left field. I went with Alpine. I don't know where they were. It was more of a disappointment they were from the fact that, like, I had no idea where they were. Like, it was, oh, we have a podium. Wait, what? Out of where? Where are you? Oh, we have points. But there's. it was such an unmemorable season for Alpine for me. And I feel like with the drivers they have, they could be so much better than they were this season. Yeah, with, with the amount of retirements that they had, Esteban Ocon is the driver with the least amount of completed laps this season, yeah. which is not what you expect out of Esteban Ocon. You know, he... like Logan they, Sargent, they, maybe. Yeah, they they should be so much better than they ended up being. And then every week that there was some sort of hype and there was another famous person from the the consortium that bought into to, you know, Alpine, they completely shit the bed. Yeah. I mean, we'll see what happens next year with like new management and everything. Um, but I think they struggled this year for sure. Yeah, they still don't have a confirmed team principal for next season, um, which is something that I think we all kind of forgot about because Otmar Safnauer um, was let go of the team. Um, There were rumors that Mattia Bonato was in the running. We haven't heard anything lately. They had basically like an interim team principal um, throughout the rest of the season. So that is going to be something that we're going to look out for going into into next year. Um, Something else that we need to look out for going into next year is Haas, who was my biggest disappointment as a team this season. Um, obviously they have a car that can qualify well and they've had a car that can qualify well for a good two years now now they need to have a car that can do more than two laps on a Sunday I need it they have a Saturday car they don't have a Sunday car that's what it is I need them to have a, a Sunday car like you know God I I I support the American team they gotta be better they do they really do um yeah, I Haas is an interesting one. It really is. Because, like, yeah. you consistently see even both of the the cars in Q, you know, Q3, and then they just completely fade and disappear on Sunday. So we will see yeah, another exactly. year. Um, I think we both agree on this honorable mention for disappointment of a team. Um if we didn't have a delay, we could do it in unison, but uh, that would be Ferrari. Um, yeah. overall, and I think it just... would also be fair to, to say specifically it's Ferrari strategy. Yeah. And not the drivers. It's the, it's the team, not the drive. I would yeah. like to specify that the strategy, the management of thing, like, I don't know. And maybe we're too hard on them. I understand strategy is very hard. A lot of it is luck whatever you want to say but there were a lot of interesting calls non-calls non-strategy drivers becoming strategists that for a team again like ferrari it just seems a little amateur yeah is that too harsh yeah Mm, i don't know it's not the worst thing we've ever said about a ferrari strategist so (laughs) it's fine it's yeah like i said i think in um in our i I think it was in our abu dhabi recap um fred vasur team principal at ferrari really needs to to reconsider his strategists and maybe make some personnel changes there um and you know that i think that having somebody you know sane would be a just even that would be a big enough help for for them next season oh we're so mean we're so mean. It's a hard job. I know it's a hard job. Yeah. I couldn't it do it. It just seems like I couldn't either. And that's why but I feel no, bad saying these can't. things. <sighs> I know. 2024. Looking forward. Looking forward. Um, so moving from team to driver, though, because I don't want to shit on Ferrari too much. I, I do feel bad because I am a Ferrari fan. Um, who disappointed you as a driver this season? You know, I... I I think that there were there were a couple options that I could have chosen, but I think that I had to go with Botas. Um, obviously, Botas is in a very uncompetitive car in that Alfa Romeo, um, but yeah. I I really feel that with the experience 
that Botas has with his years at Williams when Williams was better, with his years at Mercedes being the number two driver. Um, I, I really think that obviously he's having a great time. He still gets to to drive his his you know F one car and be be an F one driver right now. Um, but I just I really want to see more out of him, and I can only hope that next year Sauber um, gives him. A comp- like a, a more competitive car, um, so that we really remember like Valtteri Bottas is one of the best drivers on the grid. But I think that you know, honestly, I think Alex Albon can do better in that Alfa Romeo than than he's yeah. doing right now. I think he just kind of like sunk back, and like I don't know, yeah. there's no correct term for that, but he kind of just like sunk into the shadows. I think he, honestly, he's just having fun. He's like mm-hmm. I I personally feel like he's kind of towards the end of his career he doesn't have to be he could stay around for many years if he wanted to but I think he's just enjoying other extracurriculars more than driving and he's leaning into that having a good time he's driving doing a good enough job to keep a seat and that and that's where he's at because the car isn't competitive and I think it's I feel like when you don't have a competitive car you almost have to change your mindset so you don't go crazy you know oh, what I yeah. mean for someone to go from Mercedes winning races super competitive year after year to drop to mm-hmm. Alfa Romeo and be in a non-competitive car he really had to switch his mindset so I think maybe he's just having a good time now I mean we can see he's having a good time but I think maybe it's just a mindset switch for him I don't know yeah but I, I also think that you you can have a good time in a car um and also do well if you look at you know Danny Ricardo in the Alfa Tauri not a good car look at what he was able to do in Mexico so for my biggest disappointment I kind of had fun with this one yeah um coming from you know big man on campus I'm gonna lead a team and be number one guy in the group Nick DeVries where you at buddy oh yeah (laughs) no points only a handful of races to speak for you were an extreme disappointment my friend um coming in at the end of last season and drive to survive being like I'm gonna lead this team and I'm gonna be the number one driver on Alpha Tari and mer, 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 mer. how'd that go for you please tell it me it didn't so yeah he's uh he's my disappointment this year but yeah it was it was pretty disappointing obviously you know the the developments that came to the Alpha Tari car didn't come until you know towards the end of the year when when you know Lawson and Ricardo were in the car but yeah I think that you know Nick had a lot to prove after his substitution at Williams last year um which was you know one of the greatest experience you know things of, of the 2022 season and kind of killed Latifi's F1 career but it just he 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 didn't bring it, um, but he did bring us back in a Ricardo. So yep, thanks so thanks have, for that, Nick. We do have that to thank him for. Yeah, um, yeah. and then I think just dis- biggest disappointment overall in the season. Again, I think we're very in agreement on this one. And if we didn't have a delay, <laughs> we would say it in unison. <laughs> sprints. The sprints. Yep, sprint weekends. Yep. Format shit. Get rid of it. Done. Yep. How many times can we say I this mean, on this podcast? Go yeah. back to our Listen to our Qatar recap. Uh, recap. <laughs> How many times have we said that on this podcast? So oh, many. they're terrible. Catherine, they're so bad. If they don't fix it for next year, I don't know what I'm going to do. Again, no, I do. I've already said this probably on another podcast. Um, You're just going to boycott them weekends. and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cover, cover sprint weekends for us. Yep, you are. But yeah, on a more positive note, rookie of the year, Catherine, who's our rookie of the year? There, there was no other choice. It's Oscar Piastri. Um, he Obviously. had two podiums. He won the sprint race that Max didn't in Qatar. Um, he finished ninth in the drivers' championship with ninety-seven points. Um, he has had the best rookie finish in the modern era since Lewis Hamilton's rookie season, where he scored one hundred and ten points in two thousand seven with McLaren. Which, interestingly, um, top three of modern era rookies is actually Alex Albon, um, who, who had like I think ninety-three points in his rookie year in twenty nineteen, which makes sense because he was driving a Red Bull half the season. Um, yep. But when I was looking that up today, I was like, wait a minute, really, Alex? 
Um, so, but if so, you yeah, would take a to... step back and think of like modern day rookies, you have like let's take a look. I mean, you have the two at Haas from what two years ago, who all they did was crash and burn. They're not mm-hmm. getting points. There hasn't really been rookies getting points since Alex Albon. Yeah. If you, Even if you, like if, George Russell did not score points in his rookie season at all. Right, because he was at Williams. Yeah, in a year yeah. that Williams was really bad. <laughs> yeah. I remember, no, I remember watching him cry when they got a point because he was so yeah. happy he finally got one point for Williams. So they well, didn't no, when, when, he, when he got his um, his podium um, in, in a Williams at Spa because Spa was two laps long in the rain, um, like, I mean, George always look, looks like he's on the verge of tears. But anyway, <laughs> Oscar... Oscar just freaking killed it. And I, I think that he is, you know, obviously, you know, future world champion, blah, blah, blah. But like this season just really cemented that he made the correct decision to go to McLaren and, you know, be the source of all of that drama um, that just, but it, it, he he really, you know, wh- whereas Nick DeVries, you know, put up, you know, didn't put up and shut up, um, you know, Oscar Piastri, he he put his head down, he he suffered through those rough races and he he really did a great job his first season in Formula One. No, he did. And I, I think I also would like to credit the engineers for getting McLaren to a point where Oscar could have a good season. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like I, it's so hard with rookies. If they don't have a good season, they're cut, which I get it. It's cutthroat, but It makes me really happy to see him in a good car and doing well and like contending with Lando because he is a really good driver and to Mm -hmm. have a good season in a, you know, decently good car for most of the season. I think that's really going to just boost his confidence. I'm very excited to see what he does next season. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, Going into, this has been a long episode, going into some final thoughts of the the 2023 season, I have two things. One of them is something that we have already talked about, and it is we have got to change the sprint format. We already know that the sprint format is going to change. Um, Hopefully it will be better. Um, I I, Imagine if it gets worse. I don't want to. We've already spent enough time bitching about how much the, the sprint format is terrible. Um, I don't think I could take but it. But I think the, 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 the thing that almost annoys me more is um, the minimum lap time. Um, and, you know, ever since Monza, we have seen, you know, going into qualifying, you know, so, you know, 18 drivers are under investigation for breaking the minimum lap time set. Um, but here's the thing. When they, when, when that was breached at Monza, it was breached by a pair of Ferrari drivers after a Ferrari qualifying in front of the Ferrari Tifosi um, that would have rioted had the Ferrari drivers lost pole position. I, I can't remember who, who got off the top of my head. It was probably Charles. Um, but the, the race director made a choice not to penalize Ferrari um, and set the precedent that you can't penalize drivers for breaking the minimum lap time. So the only two options Formula One has next season are to actually penalize drivers for breaching this minimum lap time or just stop talking about it. Yep. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Agreed. That, and, and that is the last thing I have to say on, on the 2024 season. 2023 season. 2023 season. You're oh, getting so ahead of yourself. Almost. Ugh. It is not next year yet. Um, yeah. So early predictions for 20, 2024 is going to be a wild one. Um, we're going to already see some rules changes that I think are going to be interesting for testing. Um, they announced a few weeks ago that the testing mileage has been increased from 100 kilometers to 200 kilometers during the test periods, um, which are going to be in um, 
they're in Spain and they're in Bahrain. Um, Spain is two weeks before the first race. And then the one in Bahrain is obviously the week before the race. Um, and teams also no longer have to inform their rivals if they take part in like little demo events. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see, especially the extended um, mileage, what that's, you know, what that's going to do going into season. Yeah. Also, not a rule change, but a prediction for 2024. We've said it before, and I will say it till I'm blue in the face. Holy silly season. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. End of sentence. End of sentence. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got a lot to be look a forward one. to for 2024. I'm very excited. It was a great 2023 season. I really enjoyed the second half doing the podcast. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed it as well. We are coming back for the 2024 season, not going back in time. Um, Don't forget, we are going to be releasing one episode a week during the off season. We will be taking some time off for the holidays because you guessed it. Emily's traveling. I'm sure Catherine's traveling as well. We will have (laughs) another. (laughs) Oh, well, just kidding. Only Emily. (laughs) I need to stop traveling. Um, we will have no, episodes don't. coming out on Mondays, um, but that has been our 2023 recap, and that has been the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.